You're listening to Threads Radio. My name's Luke Fraser, and this is The Tonic. Thank you. 
music for the summer there if not necessarily the British one. That's the first three movements of Inura written in 2009 by the Cuban composer Tanya Leon. Those movements are in order the power, the sharing and teaching. So Tanya Leon born in Cuba but she's been living most of her life in the States I believe. She's been very active as a conductor as well as writing widely for opera, orchestral and vocal music contexts as well as a lot for dance, as in this piece. And she's been a key figure in fusing Latino music into the context of American classical. There's a lot of very interesting rhythmic emphasis going on in her music, in particular the clave, that distinctive rhythm used as a kind of organizing pattern in Afro-Cuban music, and which can be heard in this piece in Europe. It was written for the percussion ensemble Dance Brazil, and is a setting of texts from the Yoruban Candomblé religion, which has been described as a synthesis of traditional African animism and European Catholicism, and which dates back to the time of the Atlantic slave trade. This piece really hits for me in its mix of that almost hymnic vocal writing, which even in moments of stasis near the beginning, has this kind of spry, almost wiry, rhythmic drive to it. And then of course the percussion, and the almost punkiness of the string writing, feels really fresh to my ears in terms of the synthesis and definitely one of those moments when mixing such things together seems completely coherent and retrospectively almost somehow inevitable. That was performed by Son Sonora Voices with the Son Sonora Ensemble and Dance Brazil Percussion and they were conducted by Tanya Leon herself. The album is In Motion and that was released on Albany in 2011. Thank you. 
pieces there from Eve Begalarian's Songs from the River Project. They were in and out of the game, I am a very simple person, and Did He Promise You Tomorrow, collectively written between 2010 and 2011. So Eve Beglarian is from Michigan, originally of Armenian descent. She scored a lot conventionally in many classical contexts, but also performed and produced a lot of her own work as well all of which ranges really widely from post-minimalism through folk and spoken word, even to beat-based stuff. And a taster of some of that, of course, you heard in these three pieces. The collection they're taken from, the Songs from the River Project, uh, is currently up to volume three. I think it's ongoing, though. It reflects a four-and-a-half-month trip. Eve Beglarian took down the length of the Mississippi River in 2009, paddling and biking her way along. She's called it a human-powered trip. And this music is a response to that journey, both, I think, ethnographically in terms of some of the source material she picked up, but also personally as a response to the experiences that took place within it. There's some really lovely stuff going on in those pieces. The familiar cascading figuration of the trombone writing of In and Out of the Game, the vocal tapestry in I'm a Very Simple Person, and those slightly crunchy harmonizations in the last piece, Did He Promise You? To me, one of those almost provocative wrong note is the right note type situations. They were performed by the Guidonian Hand Trombone Quartet, Eve Beglarian on voice, Mary Rowell, guitar and violin, Megan Schubert, vocals, David Steele, clarinet, and Matt Petty, trombone. And as mentioned, they were released on the Songs from the River Project, volumes one and three, put out on Eve Beglarian's Bandcamp between 2011 and 2018. Next up, this is Emma Lou Dima.
the Serenade to Carter from Sonata No. 3, written in 1996 by Emma Lou Diemer. She was born in the 20s in Kansas City, Missouri, and she's written widely for both acoustic instruments and electronics. The Serenade to Carter was written in 1996 for the LA pianist Carol Dvorin Lancaster, whose style of playing Emma Ludima has described as combining lyricism and dynamic attention to rhythm with an imaginative use of pianistic colour. And for me, the reason I chose this piece is as a result of this bringing together so nicely of those two often distinct qualities of lyricism and rhythmic energy. It just works really well here. That was performed by Philip Amelong on piano. The album is The Takata Project and that was released on Albany in 2009. Thank you. 
Azvia by Rena Esmail. Currently living in LA, she's an Indian-American composer working in the spaces between Indian and Western classical music. She was a Fulbright scholar to India where she studied Hindustani classical music in depth and that's reflected in this piece, Tazvir, which was the first she wrote after returning from India. In her words, it's the piece in which I began to scratch the surface of the ideas and concepts that now form the backbone of the music I write. The concept is simple, a trill is passed back and forth between instruments, expanding and condensing, pulling and pushing time, and becoming densely melodically ornamented, whilst retaining a harmonic transparency. She says, Hindustani ornamentation is so beautiful and ephemeral, and this was one of my first attempts to capture these little wisps of sound on the page. That was performed by the Copeland House Ensemble, as far as I know, it's unreleased, so that was taken from their YouTube channel, posted in 2015. Next up, this is Alvin Lucier.
the magnificently named still and moving lines of silence in families of hyperbolas written between 1973 and 1974 by Alvin Lussier. He's another one of those linchpin figures of American electronic music, perhaps most famous for his classic piece, I Am Sitting in a Room. He was a member of the influential Sonic Arts Union, which included Robert Ashley, David Berman, and Gordon Mummer, all of whose music has been featured recently on this show. But Alvin Lussier's work, perhaps more than the others, has a strong scientific impetus, exploring in a range of ways both the physical properties of sound and the subjectivity of our own hearing. So Still and Moving Lines is a four-part work originally begun in 1972, Part two, of which you just heard the voice movement, consists of 11 solos for voice and various instruments, each interacting with fixed sign tones. And it's really kind of an extended study of phase interference between the singer or instrumentalist and the sign tones. So phase interference or beat frequency is effectively a rhythmic pulsing that occurs when two frequencies are very close to each other due to their sound waves coinciding with the speed being determined by the difference in the frequencies. The larger the difference, the faster the beating. And when the two tones approach unison, the beating slows down to the point where it becomes imperceptible. Now in this piece, the frequencies of the sine tones remain constant, but it is the performer who microtonally adjusts their own note 16 different times. And actually the soprano here sings against two rapidly beating tones, first with the higher one, then with the lower moving inwardly and stopping at the midpoint between them. Alvin Lussier has said of his music that the results are subtle, often too much so for the average listener to discern. I accept this obstacle to the comprehension of my works, but retain the intention as an impetus for the compositional ideas. I have to say, having seen him live a couple of times, there's usually something interesting going on with the setup, with the equipment, um, with what he's doing that actually creates quite a theatrical experience in a sense. Maybe something that doesn't entirely come across on record, but definitely worth seeing in a live context. That was performed by Rebecca Armstrong on vocals with Alvin Lussier Electronics, the album An Anthology of Electronic Music, Volume 4, and that was released on Sub Rosa in 2006.
Three pieces there by the Chicago-based Third Coast Percussion. The first two by David Skidmore were Donna from 2017 and Torched and Wrecked from 2018. And the third one was Glenn Koch's Wild Sound from 2016. 
So Third Coast Percussion are a Grammy award-winning ensemble working in the field of what I guess you could loosely call post-minimalism, and in their case, spanning a world somewhere between the precision of classical music performance and the attitude of rock or post-rock, alt-rock or whatever. They've performed and recorded work by all the usual subjects, Reich, Glass and so forth, but they also commission work from a wide range of contemporary composers as well as writing themselves. David Skidmore, who was mentioned, wrote the first two of the pieces you heard, is a member, and Glenn Koch, who they commissioned for the other piece you heard, is a composer and drummer, probably best known for playing in the band Wilco. I think one of the things that makes their music appealing and successful in the YouTube era is that there is something about the tactility of percussion music that I think more than other classical instrumental music translates very well to video. And their recent music, it has to be said, is also really beautifully mic'd and produced, which always helps. Those two pieces by David Skidmore are taken in turn from a series called Aliens with Extraordinary Abilities, a cycle of pieces exploring, in his words, a common idea that the same piece of music can move at several different speeds at the same time. And what I take from that is some of the brilliant cross rhythms that you can hear in those pieces. And the second one of those also has an electronic audio element that I'm not exactly sure if it's interactive and if so, how. Meanwhile, Glenn Koch's Wild Sound was originally a multimedia performance piece scored for everyday objects and custom-made instruments using Arduino technology. However, the last movement which you heard there was later reworked for marimbas, vibraphones, glockenspiel and crotals. So Third Coast Percussion are Sean Connors, Robert Dillon, Peter Martin and David Skidmore. The album the first two pieces were taken from is called Perpetulum and that's just been released I believe by Orange Mountain Music and the Glenn Koch piece I think is unreleased but is featured on Third Coast Percussion's YouTube channel.
You took the words right out of my heart. You you took the words right out of my mouth. You you touched my life. You you touched my life. You 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 you
The Mercurial Pamela Z there, three pieces by her. You heard Bone Music, Pop Titles You, and Obsession, Addiction, and the Aristotelian Curve, collectively written between 1986 and 92. From Buffalo, New York, Pamela Z is a fascinating figure on the fringes of the music world. She's a classically trained opera singer with a really stunning voice and she's probably become best known for combining that voice with live electronics and more recently gestural motion capture, hardware controllers and video, all using software such as Max MSP and Jitter, which gives her performances a brilliant theatrical element. And for me, her music provides an almost missing link between the work of Kathy Barbarian, Joan LaBarbera and more recently artists like Laurie Anderson. And the album from which those three pieces were taken, called A Delay Is Better, was released in 2004 and includes a lot of her key pieces from the 80s and 90s. Both those sung works and text-based pieces, such as Pop Titles You, that you heard second there. The first one, Bone People, has this kind of berserk, ritualistic quality. And the last one, Obsession, is just really rather lovely, in my opinion. They were performed, of course, by Pamela Z vocals and electronics, and the third piece featured Barbara Imhoff on harp. The album, as mentioned, A Delay Is Better, and that was released on Starkland in 2004. Closing out this episode of The Tonic, a masterpiece by George Crumb.
Black Angels by George Crumb, written in 1971, subtitled 13 Images from the Dark Land. The score is dated Friday the 13th, March 1970, with the annotation in tempore belli, in time of war, in this case of course Vietnam, and the work being a threnody is written as a lament at the state of that war. Crumb is fascinated by numerology, and the piece is largely structured around the numbers 13 and 7, which relate to fate and destiny. It also abounds in musical symbolisms, such as the tritone, the so-called diabolus in musica, or devil in music, and the trillo di diavolo, or devil's trill. And for all its atonal and technical pyrotechnics, there are also quite a few allusions to older tonal music going on, in particular a quotation from Schubert's Death and the Maiden Quartet. And these quotations, I think, give the piece an almost epic temporal sweep. Yes, it's a string quartet, but also quite unconventional. The strings are electrified, and the players double on a variety of percussion instruments, including crystal glasses and two suspended tam-tams. And at certain points you can hear a kind of ritualistic counting in various languages, German, French, Russian, Hungarian, Japanese, Swahili, and so on. And it's another one of those very few pieces of the 20th century avant-garde that have gone at least some way towards crossing over into popular culture. The New York String Quartet version was apparently one of David Bowie's favourite records, and perhaps predictably the piece has found its way into horror movie soundtracks, probably most notably that of The Exorcist. So the recording you heard there was performed by the Kronos Quartet, and that was put out on the album Black Angels, released on None Such in 1990. So that's it for another episode of The Tonic. I'd just like to say thanks in particular to Nick and everybody at Threads Radio. I'll be on a break next month, but you'll be able to hear an episode from the archive in four weeks' time on Wednesday 28th of August between 10 and 12, British summertime. And then I'll be back with the next new episode four weeks after that on Wednesday 25th of September at the same time. I'm Luke Fraser. Thanks for listening.